At 9 o'clock a.m. on the 50th day following Christ's resurrection from the dead, something miraculous happened. A group of disciples were gathered in the temple courts to worship and wait for the thing to happen that Jesus said he would do when he ascended 10 days earlier. And then all of the sudden, the Holy Spirit came down and Christ was made incarnate once again through his body, the church. At that moment, and forevermore going forward, God's people became, past tense, completed the church. On June 21st, 1924, a group of interested individuals who had been likewise gathering and praying that God might do something new again in their generation had come together in downtown Winnipeg, and on that Sunday morning, they formally organized and became what was known as the Winnipeg Gospel Tabernacle. On that day, this small congregation was united in the Holy Spirit and became, again, past tense, completed action, a church. By the way, this year that church is 97 years old and is still going on. And although we can point to a very specific date and location where both the first incarnation of the church universal and this particular and present expression of the local church became the church in a historical sense, that is not to say that there is any point between the first Pentecost and today when both the church universal and the church local have ceased to be involved in the ongoing process of becoming the church as well. The book of Acts, over the course of 28 chapters, tells a series of stories of how the fledgling group of Christ followers worked out not only their salvation with fear and trembling, but also worked out their organization as well. It tells stories of invention, of innovation, of conflict and reconciliation, of rules established, rules broken, and rules changed along the way. And the subsequent series of epistles contained within the remaining New Testament, whether authored by Paul or Peter or James or John or others, they all serve to give us a peek behind the curtain at what specific communities and congregations did to work out some of those same issues in a very local and personal context. Even the book of Revelation, which we studied together this past spring, tells the story of a church figuring out how to live into its calling in a rapidly changing and unprecedented context. In this way, it can rightly be said that the entire story of the New Testament from Pentecost onward is the story of a people called by Christ and filled by the Holy Spirit who are learning how to become the church in a greater and greater sense. Likewise, in the year of our Lord, 2021, we, as a local body of believers called the Bridge Church of Winnipeg, Manitoba, are still participants in that ongoing project of becoming the church in our day and in our city. Eighteen months ago, we had to figure out how to become the church when the church could not meet. We had to figure out how to use new technology to, to reach out more intentionally and to connect without presence or proximity. During that season, we had to break all sorts of rules. We had to invent new ways of doing things and ask what is really central to our mission. And now that we are, Lord willing, coming out of all of that disruption and we are beginning again together, it is fitting that we once again return to those questions as they arise out of our present, new, improved, hopefully, context. And to answer those questions this morning, or rather to set ourselves upon a journey of discovery where we can begin to answer those questions, it seems appropriate to me to start back with the core practices of the church in the beginning. To travel back in time, as it were, to the point in history before the church had to adapt and change and reshape itself in light of the world that it found itself in. Because as we have seen, adaptation is unavoidable. 
And contextualization is actually a part of the work of the gospel. But if you begin a process of contextualization from a point that is already contextualized, well, then you are engaging in a game of ecclesiastical telephone, whereby the core message and practices get lost as you get farther and farther away from the real original message. And so, as we return this morning to Acts chapter 2 and to one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible, we are going to examine things, the things that made the first church the church. And we're going to look to recenter ourselves on those fundamental descriptors before launching out, as they did, into our own adventure of contextualizing that message and those practices for our world today. Let's hear the word together, and then we're going to start to unpack what it looks like. Because above all else in this post-COVID world, we need to be about the business of becoming the church once again. They devoted themselves. When was the last time you devoted yourself to something? To a vocation, or a mission, or a cause, a pursuit, a person? What does it mean to devote ourselves to something? I still remember my wedding day just over 18 years ago when I devoted myself to Joanna. I remember my ordination Sunday when I devoted myself to my calling as a pastor. I remember each of the dedication Sundays for my children where I stood before the church and proudly devoted myself to the task of raising them well and in the Lord. What have you devoted yourself to? Or let me ask you the question a different way. What have you died to? You see, devoting yourself to something is another way of saying that you are dying to the alternatives. You cannot devote yourself to a plan of health and fitness and continue to hit up the drive through for a double cheeseburger three times a week. You cannot devote yourself to a vocation without giving up the search for a better career in a different field. I couldn't stand before Joanna in a church and devote myself to her fully at our wedding day without dying to the option of finding someone else out there who was better for me than she was. Now, to be honest, that was an easy task because there is no one better. In your baptism, you devoted yourself to Jesus, but also to his church. And in doing so, you died to a life ruled by and in service to self-interest and self-glorification. You devoted yourself to the church, and you died to all other more convenient or less demanding options in the world. And so we read that the earliest church devoted themselves to these practices that came to define their fellowship more than any other doctrine that would be developed in latter years or centuries. They were known for and by these things. Now, taken in order from the text, they are these four things. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship of the body, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Together, these four practices, which I call the core four, seem to form the basis for everything else the church did. Whether it be discipleship, mission, worship, or just being community, the church was the church because Jesus made it the church, but it was growing into that identity through the practice of these activities. Let's look at them individually first this morning. First, the apostles' teaching. Now, what is the apostles' teaching? Well, simply, it was the tradition handed down to them by the apostles. Now, we might want to simplify it to say, well, it's the Bible, but that would actually be going too far. Because at this point in church history, um, there was no New Testament. Those stories and letters would not be written for a decade or more into the future from this point when they met. What they had to study were the Jewish scriptures, which we refer to as the Old Testament, and the faithful proclamation of the gospel, as well as the newly contextual interpretation of those scriptures by the apostles. 
It seems that whenever they met, whether it be in the temple courts or house to house, which they did both, they would spend time considering the apostles' teaching about Jesus and what that teaching meant for how they lived and what they were supposed to do. They were a community thirsty to know more about Jesus, to know more about what he was calling them to. And so whenever they met, we read they devoted themselves to this teaching. So that's the first thing. Second thing is fellowship. Now this may go without saying at this point, but you can't be the church alone. To be a community like the church requires you to be doing life with other people. I mean, you can love God on your own, but remember what Jesus said. The second command is like it, or that the second command is part of the first command, depending on your translation. And that is this, love your neighbor as yourself. The Holy Trinity is relational. The incarnate Christ was relational. And so his people must likewise build their lives around relationships. Not that their relationships were always easy or harmonious. Even the apostles sometimes experienced infighting. See Galatians chapter 2 for more information on that story. Uh, But they were devoted to making fellowship work in their context. Thirdly, we have the breaking of bread. Now, this practice was also multifaceted. Yes, at its most basic level, we can read this as having to do with the table of the Lord's Supper, or communion, the the table you see before you in the auditorium this morning. Jesus, after all, commanded his disciples to do these things in remembrance of him whenever they gathered. The church that is devoted to the historical pattern of worship is one that gathers around this table regularly. But in a broader sense, it was about the practice of breaking bread together beyond this holy meal. You see, in the earliest days of the church, before there were church buildings or cathedrals or professional clergy or the institution of the church, the people gathered to share table hospitality together. In the culture of their day, there was no more intimate and meaningful act of fellowship and relationship than sharing a meal with people. And so we see as the pattern of the church that the agape meal, or the love feast as it is sometimes called in English, was a larger gathering of believers where they could eat together, share a meal, and then the Eucharist, or communion, was a central part of the larger experience. To bring it down to brass tacks, we could say that the earliest Christians were devoted to sharing life together through table fellowship. The colloquial breaking of bread, if you will. And lastly, they were devoted to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. You see, there was nothing that they did in those days that was not saturated in prayer. They believed in prayer. They believed that when they prayed, God heard them. And they believed that when they prayed, that they heard God as well. The earliest Christians believed that when they prayed, the world changed around them. That prisoners would be set free. That powers would be toppled. That the persecuted would be protected. That the sick would be healed. And because they believed these things, they devoted themselves to the practice of prayer. Their actions, their their practices followed the pattern of their beliefs. And I wonder here this morning, as the congregation called The Bridge Church gathers for the first time in far too long, what is it that we believe enough in to act upon? What is it that we believe enough to devote ourselves to? And if we believe, as they did in these things, then how might these practices form the foundation for our renewed journey toward becoming a church in the post-pandemic landscape of 2021 and beyond? We're going to pause the message here for a few more items in the service liturgy, and then I'll be back to explore those questions with you just a bit further. Hang tight. I'll be back in a moment. morning. My name is Trisha Akerley and I'm one of the elders at the Bridge Church and I'd like to take a moment to talk to you about the offering. At the Bridge Church we teach that giving which honors God is always three things. 
priority, proportional, and progressive. This morning, I would like to speak about that first value, giving ought to be a priority. We know it can seem like a challenge sometimes to give when our own desires and needs seem to never be satisfied. We all have bills to pay, things to save for, and indulgences that we want to enjoy. But the scriptures tell us that God desires not what is merely left over after all our other needs and wants are met, but rather the first fruits of our income. Practically, that means we are a people who are committed to radical trust, that what God has provided us with will be enough to meet our needs even if we give him what he is due. As the scriptures promise us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. If we make God our first priority, he promises to make sure to meet our needs. That is what we mean when we say that we teach that giving as a part of worship is a matter of priority. If you'd like to give today, there are a number of ways that you can do so, most of which are on the screen right now. God is worthy of our first and our best, so decide today not to give him any less than that. So what does it mean to be devoted to those same things today? And how might that devotion help us build a foundation for our pursuit of becoming the church more fully in our context? Well, let's start with the Apostles' teaching. It's probably the only one of these four practices that was not significantly disrupted to a negative effect during the pandemic. You see, from the very first week of COVID, we were able to pivot to our online services so that the preached word could continue to go out. And while we were online, every single part of our regular church practice in some way or another needed to be reinvented and re-envisioned. And sometimes that happened to their detriment. Unfortunately, I mean, we got better and better each month at doing music online, but even our very best online worship set pales in comparison to joining the choir of the congregation in song here together this morning. And, and don't get me wrong, I loved the creativity behind our kids' men moments. But let's not pretend for a moment that they were anywhere near as impactful as our kids being loved and taught by living, breathing Sunday school teachers as they are right now upstairs. Some of the things we got to do were cool, but most of the things, if we're honest, suffered for a lack of being physically together. But the one thing that was able to continue largely uninterrupted through COVID was our preaching time. Now, whether you prefer the old format or you've come to appreciate this new format of teaching, uh, we never stopped opening up the Word and take it, talking about it every single week. And if we are to continue on the path of becoming the church, we never can. A devotion to the Apostles' teaching doesn't have to look like a traditional sermon or even like this new video lesson format that we're doing now. It can be happening in a large group in a, or in a small group. It can be in a church building or it can happen in a home. It can even happen over the internet as it has for the past 18 months. If people are to progress to be, toward becoming the church in their day and age, they need to hear it no matter the format. See, the world may shift and culture may change. The questions that we ask of the scriptures may be radically different than the questions our grandparents or great-grandparents would ask of the scriptures. And even the application of our study may move and morph as history marches on. But the fact that the scriptures, the apostles' teaching, is central to our understanding of God, is central to our understanding of ourselves and our world, that's never going to change. A church that is not devoted to the apostles' teaching cannot rightly call itself a church. And one that wanes in their devotion will eventually wane in their identity as the church. Now, if devotion to the apostles' teaching was largely unimpeded by the pandemic, well, then we could easily say the opposite is true for the devotion of fellowship. Whether that is a formal fellowship in a worship service or an informal fellowship with fellow believers outside of a church event, 
We have felt the strain of isolation and the absence of friends and loved ones through this past season. And even as we now are coming back to a place where we can be together, we're finding that it's not as effortless as we might have imagined coming back together being. You see, the thing about relationships is that they're dynamic. They are never static, and so you cannot be in relationship without change happening. You cannot be in relationship without work being needed. You cannot be in relationship and expect it to always be easy. In Christian fellowship, we will disagree, and we've changed our opinions, and we disagree on things. Sometimes we'll disagree sharply. But to be devoted to the fellowship means that we die to the self-centered, easy path of only associating with like-minded people. See, this is honestly one of the great dangers of our age and something that right now we need to be on guard against in the church. Friends, we will not all agree. Right now, we are in a polarizing season in the world. We are in the midst of an emotional and at times contentious federal election. We are divided over issues like vaccine passports, public health mandates, and economic assistance programs. But to be devoted to the fellowship of the church means that we have died to our own interests and preferences as things that might be ultimate. The latter description that the people had everything in common is not a statement about how like-minded they were on every matter. We only need to get to Acts chapter 8 to see how ethnic and socioeconomic divisions represented one of the first points of adaptation the church had to engage with. But what it means is that they had the common commitment to the mission and the fellowship of the church. And a church with mission can overcome internal dissonance because the main thing always remains the main thing. We can learn if we're devoted to fellowship. The breaking of bread is, of course, one of the main things about church for me. You wouldn't probably be surprised to hear that. And I want you to know that throughout the pandemic, when we have not been sharing of this table as a congregation, I have not been taking some sort of pastoral privilege and feasting alone. The Lord's Supper without the Lord's people is just an empty snack. And I have longed to dine with you. Even when we had those terrible, awful, no good, very bad communion pods as a concession to the pandemic protocol, and you'll be happy to know those are now gone, I still hungered at those times for this meal. But like we see in Acts 2, the longing was more than just for a sacred feast. It was a longing to break bread together. I've missed seeing you all at clergy coffee hour or over breakfast at a greasy spoon or at a barbecue or a church potluck where we could share table fellowship together. I've missed just doing life with you as my congregation. One of the plans we had for small groups this semester before we had to postpone was this idea that small groups would always meet around a meal. There is something still today, even in our culture, about eating together that builds fellowship like nothing else we can do. We wanted you to experience that and to grow through that practice. And we'll likely get back to that in a few months when things are a bit more stable and we've survived whatever the fourth wave is going to throw at us. But for those of you who are meeting with each other house to house even today, even when the church isn't officially doing something, And let me encourage you, why not put some thought to the value of intentionally breaking bread together as well? Start a meal together with the reading of a psalm. Have an intentional discussion about a scripture text, perhaps even the previous Sunday's sermon. And spend some time praying together at the table. These are small things, but these little gestures go a long way on the journey toward becoming the church in a more real and holistic way than we have been. And then we come to prayer. And here's my mea culpa. Our services over COVID have lacked prayer. Some of you have lovingly called me out on that fact, and to you I accept the critique. I'll be honest, praying into a camera lens to be recorded for later consumption by both known and unknown participants on the internet, it just felt weird to me. And in some ways it felt very fake and somewhat icky. Perhaps that's a poorly articulated theological conviction that I need to 
spell out more, or perhaps it's just a quirky personal thing, but it is the truth of the matter. But now that we're able meet to meet again, we are able to pray again, and, and not just pray together again, but we can learn what it means to once again be devoted to prayer as a congregation. To that end, I'm inviting you, yes, you, once again, to join me for weekly morning prayer. Every Tuesday morning, I will be at the church in the boardroom at 7 o'clock a.m., and from 7 a.m. to 7.45 a.m., I will be praying for our church, our city, and the world, and I'd like you to join me. Hopefully that's early enough for most of you so you can join us and then still get off to work in time. And if it's not, let me encourage you, why not start your own prayer time? There's nothing stopping you, but being devoted to prayer is impossible to achieve if, achieve if we don't actually pray. And it's impossible to achieve together as a church if we don't pray together. Now those devotions are what I call, like I said, the core four. But there are three additional practices that see, we, they seem to have been devoted to as well. They aren't like the headliners, but they're in the list. Number five would be a shared interest. It says all believers were together and had everything in common. Number six would be generosity. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And note that that's not just the church, it's to anyone. And then number seven was worship. In all things, they continued to praise God. Next week, we're going to continue this examination of Acts chapter 2 by looking at those final three practices and how they bolster and animate these core four practices. But for today, let's ponder together how a priority of devoting ourselves to these practices might help us hit the reset button in our experience of being the church and help set us on a new path. With that being said, let's pray.